Welcome to our Berkeley Theological Institute. Glad to be with you all. Uh, last week we studied Mariology. Reminds me, Mariology is the study of Mary. Mary. Anytime we see O L O G Y at the end of a word, it's typically the study of something. So if Mariology is the study of Mary, then this evening, because we are at the Catholic Church named after the Holy Family. Who is, who is the Holy Family? When we speak of the Holy Family, we're speaking of? Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. In the front of our church, you'll notice we have a statue of the Holy Family, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. Many images have, there are many images of Mary with the child Jesus. What I love about our church over here is that we have an interesting thing where we have an, an image of Mary, the Lady Guadalupe. But then where is Jesus to be found on the other side, held by St. Joseph. Joseph? We've noticed that before in the church. We have the holy family of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. <coughs> any of us old enough to remember any nuns who taught us at the top of our letters in an age when we used to send letters? They put a sign of the cross, and then JMJ, and then another sign of the cross. What did the JMJ stand for? Huh? Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. The other two young to remember that. <laughs> so this holy family of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. Interestingly, we know, of course, that the holy family is a, there are the patron saints of various other churches. There are other holy family Catholic churches. There are universities. There are other institutions that are named after the holy family. There's a, actually a town in Mexico as well with many people here in Austin who come from a town called Jesus Maria y Jose, in the state of Jalisco. So the Guiarandas restaurant that we have in Austin, called by a family from Jesus Maria, they call it for short. Right. Jesus Maria y Jose. Right. So if Mariology is the study of Mary, then Josephology is the study of Joseph. Joseph. <laughs> this is a new area of study, I have to tell you, that when I was in the seminary 20 years ago, Josephology had not been invented yet. So what we're doing this evening wow. is an interesting new study of Joseph. Why so long? Why, why has it taken so long? Excellent question. As we're going through this evening, let's ask ourselves, because what we're going to notice is that in the history of the church, there were various uh, beliefs that arose regarding Joseph, but none of them come from the early church. So think about that for a moment. Most of what we believe today about Joseph comes from recent history rather than from the early church. The early church is going to give us very little about Joseph. The scripture is going to tell us very little about him. And so what, what we know or believe about Joseph comes more from the tradition of the church of the last 500 years, roughly. Is he less important? Is Joseph less did they, important? Did they consider him less important, I guess? So they did consider Joseph less important. Can we guess why that might have been? Because why? Go God ahead. came to Mary, did the situation with Mary, not Joseph? There you go. So of these three, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, Jesus, of course, gets the bulk of the, the attention, which is why there's a whole other study of Jesus. What's the study of Jesus called? Is it called Jesus? Jesusology? Yeah. Christology. 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 So Christology then is the study of Jesus, of Christ. Christology, there are all sorts of books and works and courses on Christology. Jesus, and we know that Jesus was born of Mary. Mary traditionally conceived of Jesus not with Joseph. Those two didn't have anything... There's nothing between the two of them. Mary conceived how? By the Holy Spirit. So that means that Mary gave birth to Jesus. These are the more important players in the history of salvation. We call it the economy of salvation. Joseph sort of gets left out on the side here. Joseph, for the record, is not Jesus' blood father, according to the tradition. But Joseph plays an important role because if it were not for Joseph, Mary would have been stoned. Why would Mary have been stoned? She was an unwed, unwed mother. She was an unwed mother. She was pregnant. She was with child. 
outside of marriage. Mm. That was a stonable offense. Except that Joseph took Mary into his home, according to the tradition, uh, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph, and Joseph thinking, oh, no, 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 no. My uh, <laughs> betrothed, my fiancé is pregnant, and I know it ain't from me. <laughs> this is not cool. Joseph could just as easily have, have divorced Mary, left her. That would have exposed her to being stoned. Instead, he took Mary into his home, and according to the tradition, raised Jesus as his son. So Joseph protected Mary, and he gave Jesus an earthly father. And he gives all Christians a model for fathers. So far, so good? Ready to jump in? An introduction, then. Many Catholic churches have patron saints. So our patron saints here at Holy Family is the Holy Family. Many churches, hospitals, Catholic institutions are named for the Holy Family. A number of religious communities take the Holy Family as their patron saints, which is why we have this tradition of putting those, those letters at the top of the letters that the, the nuns and the priests just used to send. The Holy Family, think about this for a moment. When did the Holy Family become a popular subject in art? Only in the 1490s. So literally, for the... For the last 500 years we have images of the Holy Family of Mary and Joseph and the child Jesus for 500 years we've been drawing pictures of them and painting them we don't have images of the Holy Family that date to 1000 AD or to 500 AD we have pictures that date to the 1490s First painting, in fact, that we've been able to trace was by Luca Signorelli in Italy. First prints of the Holy Family that we find north of the Alps were by Albrecht Durer. And then after that, after the 1490s, these become really popular because we see these images of Mary and Jesus with the child, and suddenly there's just something about that. I mean, think about how that mirrors our own coupling. Man. Mary's woman, the two of them have a child or children, and suddenly they become a model for all Christian families and for all Christian couples. This is in an age before, oh, I have to be careful in how I say this, I was going to say before same sex marriages, but the church, the ancient church, did have blessings of same sex couples. This is a fascinating thing that the Roman Catholic Church has not explored. But as part of the Utrecht Summer School over in Utrecht in the Netherlands, we had one afternoon class which was this fascinating exploration of some of the old blessings of same-sex friends in the history of the church. In an age then when the norm was for man to marry woman, woman to marry man, and to have children then, Joseph and Mary suddenly became the model family. And so beginning in the 1490s, we're going to see an explosion of images. Of course, about the same time, we are soon going to be inventing the printing press. So as you can imagine, once we start getting the printing press going, and start getting these paintings and images of the Holy Family, then that's going to be a popular subject in art. In art, we'll see it both among the Italian painters and also up in the, the area of the Netherlands, the Low Countries, which uh, at that time was uh, you know, Holland, the Netherlands, Flemish painters. We're going to see a lot of people who are interested in painting this, the Holy Family. Interestingly, there are going to be, there's going to be, as we start painting the Holy Family, we're going to start putting other people into those paintings too which is going to make for these interesting paintings of, filled with Jesus' family. Because we know that the proto-gospel of James gave us Mary's parents' names. So Mary's parents were Joachim and Anna, Joachim and Anna according to that tradition. So suddenly, we start filling in all these other people. Jesus, we know, had 
a cousin, the Gospel of Luke says that Mary went to visit her relative, Elizabeth, and Elizabeth and Zechariah were pregnant with child, and their child was St. John the Baptist. So suddenly we're going to repopulate these pictures of Jesus' family. And then it becomes even more fascinating because now that we're beginning to paint all of Jesus' family members based on the stories that we're hearing, we know that the church celebrates Jesus on what day? December the 25th is Christmas. In the Gospel of Luke, it says that when Mary went to Elizabeth, Elizabeth was in her sixth month. So according to the tradition, if Mary is just finding out that she's pregnant, Elizabeth is six months into her pregnancy. That means that the church is going to celebrate St. John the Baptist's birth roughly six months before Jesus. Mm. Follow me? So when do we, we celebrate Jesus' birth on December the 25th? Can you guess when we celebrate St. John the Baptist's birth? June. Six months June. earlier? That would be June the 24th that the church celebrates the birth of St. John the Baptist. It's a song in Spanish. Uh, El Día de San Juan. El 24 de junio. De junio. Mm. 24 de junio, el día de la fiesta de San Juan. And now that painters are painting all these great pictures of Jesus' childhood, we're also going to get painters who start painting John the Baptist as a child, together with Jesus as a child. And so we're going to have these fascinating paintings which, as I suggest here on the handout, which is also available in the link under the video, there is no scriptural confirmation of Joseph, of, of Jesus and John the Baptist ever knowing one another as kids, but it's going to be a popular theme in art. Right. Two boys, often nude or scantily clad in the same painting together by these Italian and or Dutch Flemish artists, it may very well be John the Baptist and Jesus. And so, now that Grandpa Rudy has gone to the church and seen this painting of John the Baptist and Jesus, and the grandkids are asking him, when did they know one another as kids? How did the story go? That after Joseph and Mary came back from Egypt, remember that story, the flight into Egypt, the Gospel of Matthew? They came back, and they lived for a time with Elizabeth and Zacharias, such that Joseph excuse me, that Jesus and John the Baptist were growing up together for a time. Does the scripture say anything about this? The scripture doesn't say anything about this. But it was a nice way of explaining those paintings that we were now seeing in the 16th and 17th centuries. But Mary and Elizabeth are cousins. It does say that in the Bible, right? Although it does not say that they're cousins, it, it does suggest that they're relatives. relatives. <clears throat> the question becomes, how do we understand that, that term? How close, are relative, how close were they to the relatives? We don't know. Hmm. But, uh, John was a very, uh, rebe uh, well, I shouldn't say rebellious. He was, he was just, had a long beard and, and a belt, right? According to the scriptures, when John appeared, he was wearing camel skin, which camel. a lot of people in that time didn't wear camel skin, right, with a belt around his waist. He was out in the wilderness, which is why we have this picture of him being like with a big scraggly beard and with hair that yeah, hadn't seen hair. a barber in a while. And it said that he ate locusts, yeah. grasshoppers. <laughs> So we do get the picture of John the Baptist being somewhat different from most people at that time. John the Baptist believed that the kingdom of God was near, which simply means that if, if the end is near, then if you're not right with God, you better be careful because in the ancient mind, if everything is divided into two buckets, then after you end this world, you're going into one of two places, and that's going to be either heaven or hell. And unless you want to go to hell, then you might want to find a way to be good with God. John the Baptist, according to the tradition, suggested that the way you can get good with God 
is by turning your life around. Fancy word that we use is metanoia. Metanoia, turn your life around. And be baptized. John preached a baptism of repentance, metanoia, and baptism. Metanoia is the word. The Holy Family then was celebrated at the local and regional level since the 17th century, in plain English this is the 1600s. So in the 1600s, we began to celebrate the Holy Family during Mass. In the 1600s, we began doing that. And then the Feast of the Holy Family was approved in 1921. Help me with the math. 101 years ago. We've been celebrating what we celebrate on the Sunday after Christmas, the solemnity or the feast of, of the Holy Family, is something that we've been doing now for 101 years, for roughly 1 20th of our history as a church. Pope Benedict XV in 1921 presented the Holy Family as a model for all and approved the, the feast of the Holy Family. The feast of the Holy Family, when do we celebrate it? It's always on the Sunday between December the 25th and January the 1st, which is why I always refer to it as the Sunday after Christmas, except when Christmas falls on a Sunday. Because if Christmas, December the 25th, falls on a Sunday, January the 1st is going to fall on a Sunday because they're always seven days apart. So we just move the Feast of the Holy Family forward to December the 30th, to that Friday, on the years when it would otherwise be on a Sunday. So would that mean that we would do that this year because December 25th falls on the Sunday? I haven't looked at the calendar. Is that true? Mm -hmm. This year, December the 25th is a Sunday. That means that we'll be celebrating Holy Family not on a Sunday this year, but on Friday. We also have baptism the first communion that day too. True. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, busy day. <laughs> In scriptures, the Holy Family appears the Holy Family of Mary, Joseph, and Jesus, or Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, those three appear in a few stories together. What are some of those stories? The story of Jesus' circumcision. It's interesting because in the birth, we presume that they were all there, but we don't have stories of, well, we, we do hear that you know they traveled to Bethlehem, there was no sin, and so they gave birth to a child. After that, we see Joseph and Mary at the time of Jesus' circumcision, which was eight days after the birth. They took him to the temple to be circumcised. We see him at the presentation in the temple. We see them during the flight to Egypt, not a flight like in an airplane, but, but fleeing from, from uh, Galilee into Egypt. The return to Nazareth and the finding in the temple, which was when Jesus was roughly 12 years old. Joseph and Mary were observant Jews. They were not Catholic. They were Jews. They were a Jewish family, which means that they took Jesus with them for their annual pilgrimage to Jerusalem with other families. That's important because we always traveled in numbers. A family would not go from Galilee in the north down to Jerusalem alone because it wasn't safe. So you'd get together lots of families. We'd all leave together, go together, Come back, which is why in the in the Gospels in the Gospel of Luke we have that story of Jesus getting lost at the temple, and it took Mary and Joseph three days, according to this story. The Bible is not a book of history; the Bible is a book of theology. It took them three days to figure out that he wasn't with them. It gives the idea of a large number of families traveling together. But it took you three days to figure out your kid wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about bad you know what I mean. When I was a child, we we walked together to the movies. Like a lot of people from our neighborhood went together. We had to go Safety and downtown. There you go. And uh, in order to for protection, yeah. the older ones and all that, yeah. and, and the whole group would go together yeah. to the movies. Safety in numbers. A certain herd mentality even among human beings. So having talked about the Holy Family now, now let's focus in on this guy, Joseph. 
Joseph Salaji then, this new study that has arisen since I was in the seminary 20 years ago, is the theological study of Joseph, who of course is the husband of Mary. With the growth in Mariology, interest arose in Joseph as well, which is why we have this new theological discipline. People who just spend their time, priests and brothers and nuns, who are studying Joseph all day. Any questions before we start looking at the scriptures to see what we can learn about Joseph from the scriptures? In the Bible, if you were to open up your Bible, where would you find stories of Joseph? Matthew and Luke are both going, both going to have Joseph as a descendant of King David, which is important because back then, the genealogy is just going to be tracing the men, right? This was a, an androcentric, a male-centered world, which means that we trace we trace back the line through, through the guys. And so they're going to trace back Jesus through Joseph to get to King David, which is an interesting thing because Jesus does not share Joseph's blood. Follow me? But because Joseph took him into his household, legally, Jesus was part of his house, which was, if you trace it back, the house of David. Can we prove that? We can't prove that. This is in an age before records. So what we have are, it's an oral tradition, meaning we handed it down by based on what we heard for many years until we wrote it down. After Mary was found to be with child of the Holy Spirit, and her husband Joseph being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. That's the story that comes to us from the Gospel of Matthew. What we love is that there are four stories of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Luke has the angel Gabriel appearing to Mary. We've heard that story before. That's the only Gospel that tells that story of of the angel Gabriel appearing to Mary. That's Luke. Luke's the only one. Matthew tells us a similar story, but it's not about the angel Gabriel. Who comes to Joseph? The angel of the Lord, whoever that is, comes not to Mary, but to Joseph. So Joseph now becomes the hero in the Jesus story. And interestingly, even his very name, Joseph, where have we heard of another Joseph in the scriptures before? Do we know of any other Joseph in scripture? The multicolored coat. Oh, it's like the color dream coat, right? The Joseph of the, of the, the many colored coat comes, is a story that we find in the book of Genesis in the later chapters of it. After we talk about Adam and Eve and Noah and all the creation, then we get the patriarchs, Abraham, uh, Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca, Jacob and Leah and Rachel. And then we have Jacob's son, Joseph, who goes down, goes down into Egypt, which becomes this fascinating thing because now we have Joseph rescuing his siblings and you know them coming out of Egypt. And the scriptures are going to tell us that the Messiah is going to come out of Egypt as well. So if the Messiah is going to come out of Egypt, then our question becomes, how do you get Jesus, who was born up, who was born in Bethlehem, but then who's later going to be up here in Galilee, how do you get him way over here to Egypt? Matthew had the answer. What was Matthew's answer? The flight into Egypt. Why did they have to flee into Egypt, according to the story? Because Herod, Herod. Petrarch, the king up in this area, decided, found out that, that the Messiah had been born. And so according to the story, he ordered the slaughter of all the infants, and so they had to get out of there. The Bible is a book of theology. It's not a book of history. There's no historical document that talks about a slaughter of all the kids. You, you'd imagine that we'd, we'd have some document that talks about this, right? In this year... King Herod ordered the slaughter of all the kids. There's no document, there's no historical document that speaks to this, so we figure that this is Matthew's way of getting Joseph and Mary into Egypt, so 
so that it could fulfill the scriptures, where the scriptures say, out of Egypt I called my son. What was, uh, you know, in some of the movies they show blood on the, on the door. Is, was that symbolic of a woman? Good question. That's another story. Or what? It's an excellent question. It's another story, but the fleeing is happening in the other direction. In that story, which is the story of the Passover, we find ourselves in Egypt now, and that's where on the night of Moses, who they believe had a stuttering problem, the Bible suggests that he had some speech impediment. So if you're looking for a patron saint of speech impediments, Moses could be a good one for that. Moses is trying to tell Pharaoh, let, 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 let my people go. I apologize if that was offensive to you. Moses is going up to Pharaoh with this speech impediment, and Pharaoh is keep blowing him off, and every time God sends in a, a plague, the tenth plague was the killing of the firstborn of every household. So pause for a moment and think about your firstborn son or daughter. Imagine for a moment if God were to take that one from you. There's one way to prevent that. What Mario is referring to then is in order to make the angel of death pass over your house, you just put blood on the lintel, and when the angel of death sees that, it will pass over your house and will bother you. All those events were taking place before we fled out of Egypt. Oh, before. Which foreshadowed the prophet saying, out of Egypt I have called my son. Other stories we have in scripture then? When Jesus was 12, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem where he was lost in the temple. And then after that, we don't know what happened to Joseph. The scriptures suggest that when Jesus began his ministry, and we, we guess that he was 27 to 30 years old-ish when he began his ministry, he was later in life when he was baptized and began his ministry. At that time, there's a reference to him being Joseph's son, Luke 4.22. Or in Matthew, they call him the carpenter's son. So there's some reference to Joseph there. Was Joseph still living? We don't know. All that we know is that by this point, Jesus, who had grown up, is now being referred to as Joseph's son or as the carpenter's son. We also have references, especially in the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew gives us the names of Jesus' brothers. Do we not know? The, uh, this is the son of, this is the carpenter's son. This is the brother of James and Joseph and Simon and Judas. Are his sisters, oops, another typo. Are his sisters not here? We know who this guy is. Okay. How are we supposed to understand that line about Jesus' brothers and sisters? Jesus had brothers and sisters? Okay, that's kind of cool and mind-blowing. The Catholic tradition has traditionally been to based on a mistranslation of Isaiah 7.14, which is in Matthew 1.23, they mistranslated the word young lady. A young lady will be with child. They mistranslated it as virgin. A virgin will be with child. Out of that, we get the belief of Mary's virginity. Have you heard it called the Blessed Virgin Mary? Blessed Virgin, where does that come from? The mistranslation. So it was mistranslated, <coughs> and they just kept it that way all these years? Yeah. What do you do? Good, Jordan, that's an excellent insight. What do you do when you believed for centuries that she was a virgin? <coughs> now you're going to tell us she wasn't a virgin? It's a tough one. So how does, how does the Roman Catholic Church explain that? <coughs> I'd like to keep going with it. If they know for sure it's a mistranslation, nobody said, hey, why do you keep saying it? If it's a mistranslation, you know it. We're not dumb. Like. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the church uses some great phrases like the fides populi. Fides populi, which simply means what? The faith of the people. It is the faith of the people that Mary is a virgin. 
we believe that, that Mary's virgin because that's what Catholics believe. Catholics have believed for centuries that Mary is a virgin. So do other religions not believe that she was a virgin? That's an excellent question. Most non-Roman Catholic religions have no problem with thinking that Mary... But it's the, mentioned right here oh. where he says, we know his brothers James Joseph, Simon, and Judas. His uh, sisters are here with us. Where then did he get his wisdom? There you go. Mario is quoting from Father Roy's rosary. Thank you, Father Roy, for throwing a curveball into this conversation. <laughs> Father Roy, <laughs> we just said that just now. I was surprised. The brothers of another mother. <laughs> yeah, so how do we understand that? <laughs> Catholics have tended to believe that Mary had Jesus, boom, end of story. One child. There are other <coughs> possibilities. Maybe Mary had Jesus as the oldest child when she was still a virgin. She had Jesus. Follow me. Right. The, the, the virgin Mary was became pregnant and had her first son, who was Jesus. And then came Joseph, excuse me, what were the names? Judas and Tim and Aaron. Joseph. Tim and the sister. So Mary had this gaggle of kids. <laughs> Many non-Catholics have no problem believing that. Or there's a sort of compromise position, if you will, that if Jesus had brothers and sisters, maybe these brothers and sisters were not blood brothers to Jesus, but instead came from... Joseph was married before. Uh, because what's going to happen is Joseph disappears from the scene. We don't know when Joseph dies. So in the popular imagination, we imagine <clears throat> Joseph being older than Mary. So if Joseph is older than Mary, and Mary, of course, at the time of puberty, some 12, 13, 14 years old, would have been married off to Joseph. So in the popular imagination, we've had no problem believing that Joseph had a previous marriage, that he was older than Mary. And that, why is, there, why is it hard to believe then that Joseph we have uh, kids from an, another marriage. That Jesus had brothers from another mother. What do you? Yeah, because uh, I thought was taught in Catholic churches. Even I taught my kids. I never knew that you know Joseph was previously married or had you know siblings uh -huh. or like because you would think brothers and sisters is like well it's like we call us each other brothers and there sisters. You know? Yeah. So anyway. So there are different ways of understanding that we. That, the truth is, we will never know. Mm. All we have are these ancient words in another language, Greek, that we translate to English. And we, when we translate to English, we have brothers and sisters. Uh -oh. <laughs> I don't understand that. Does it mean my family members? In Spanish, the word that we use for cousin is mi primo hermano. So we use the same, the same expression. Okay. So how to understand that? We don't know. But what's interesting about this is because we because there's this idea of Joseph, we'll put him as the bearded man here, was older. There's no mention of Joseph apart from Jesus being Joseph's son or the son of the carpenter, which is which led to this tradition in the church of, of Joseph being much older and of Joseph dying at some point before Jesus' death. Because if Joseph were still alive, <coughs> then we probably would have mentioned Joseph as part of the whole crucifixion right. story. Right. Jesus was crucified. His mother was at the cross. Okay, where was his dad? I, I, Joseph of Arimathea asked to get the, the body down from the cross. If Joseph were alive, he probably would have done that. I have a, I was watching the Ten Commandments, and, and as they were coming out of, uh, there was a Herod, or a release, not Herod, uh, what? Herod. Herod. The king uh -huh. released all these Jews, and they were carrying Joseph's body out of wherever yeah, that they were from. A, what is? What are they? Were they all wrapped up in cloth? One their mom, sar, their sar, mummy, sarcophagus. Uh, are you thinking of this Joseph, or are you thinking of this Joseph in Genesis? Well, if it, if it was a story like the Ten Commandments, or sort of like an Old Testament story. Maybe. But it may have been a story of this guy. Here. Oh, okay. So I, I got it wrong. So, and, that, and, and 
the, the people who wrote this story wanted you to confuse the two. Because suddenly now we're associating this Joseph with another Joseph. Follow me? Mm. With one of the great patriarchs of the church. And the same way that this Joseph helped his brothers and sisters out of Egypt, what is Joseph going to do? The Messiah is going to come out of Egypt. He's the one who's leading the Messiah out of Egypt. Mm. They wanted to confuse you. Mm -hmm. They wanted you to think Patriarch Joseph when you hear this Joseph. Mm -hmm. But these stories go side by side. You can't read one story without the other story. Which you may not have heard of this before. I know, I know that Father Roy has mentioned it in a homily. St. Joseph is the patron saint of a good death. Simply because imagine, imagine the way that Joseph, St. Joseph died. On um, the <coughs> invite that we had on Facebook for this, you may have seen the image of Joseph in bed die, and who's at his side? Jesus, Jesus and Mary. Oh, well, that's kind of a cool way to die. If you're gonna have two people at your deathbed, you'd wanna be St. Joseph. St. Joseph, the patron saint of a happy death, being surrounded as he was in our popular imagination. Scripture doesn't say anything about this, but we imagine Jesus being on one side, holding one hand, and Mary holding the other hand as he's taking his last breath. Some, some say that, that he was a foster child. I mean, a foster father. Some say that Joseph was a foster father. Why would they say that? Remember, there's no blood here. There was no, yeah, he's no not, relation. He's not, he's not, he's his father by blood. Jesus was born by the Holy Spirit. But he sponsored him. But he took him into his home and, and raised he, him. He taught him. Yeah. You're Jesus' stepdad. His adopted father. They were carpenters. Jesus went on fishing and miracles in the world. So far, so good? No. Can no. you go over who that Jesus was over there again? I mean, that <laughs> Joseph? <laughs> I didn't get it. Sure. <laughs> that Jesus. That Joseph. Well, so who are these Josephs? Yeah, that's right. That's, I like to know, too. So this Joseph we know is part of the Holy Spirit. Right, family. yeah. Who was this Joseph named after? He's not the first Joseph in history. He was named after a Joseph that we find in the book of Genesis. This is toward the end of Genesis. So if you look, open up your Bible, like Genesis chapter 25, you'll see the stories of this Joseph, who was the son of Jacob. Again, the Bible's not a book of history, it's a book of theology. So when we're trying to trace how all these people fit together, that Joseph was the son of Jacob, who was the son of Isaac, who was the son of Abraham. And so this Joseph, remember Jacob had several kids, the 12 tribes of Israel. Israel is Jacob. And so Joseph is going to be one of Jacob's kids. Joseph is the one who, because his father really, really liked him, liked him enough that his father gave him a fancy little multicolored coat, the scriptures say. Fancy little coat. So you can imagine the little Joseph being as proud as he was like a little proud peacock in his fancy colored coat. And his brother said, we're gonna take care of him. Threw him into a well, faked his death, shipped him off to Egypt, <coughs> where he rose in power and became the counselor to uh, part of the household of the, the head eunuch of the Pharaoh. But Mary was the one that was scolding Jesus in a way at the beginning uh, when he was at the uh, he had lost in the temple. In the wedding. Uh, oh, in the hey, wedding. Hey, yeah. You need to do something, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, they run out of wine. Do something. And, and she scolded him again when he was preaching at the temple, right? I mean, he was a child. She told him. She said, "Why have you done this to us?" We've been all over the place, you know. And, but Joseph never said anything, really. I mean, did I know of? The scriptures have no words for Joseph. Joseph is a silent figure. Mm -hmm. There's nowhere, it's a, there are stories of Joseph, then the angel Lord appeared to Joseph and did this and did that, but we don't have any words that anyone's put into Joseph's mouth. Where Joseph says, yes, I will do this, Lord. Here I am. I come to you, no. There's, there are no words that are attributed to Joseph. I just paid 
pays more of a tribute to Mary, considering that was an andro androcentric world. Which was a radical thing. Yeah. But for the early Christians, Mary was more important because Jesus came into this world through Mary. He was just the foster father. We would have the story, any guy could do this. It was Mary who gave birth to him. But that was radical in an androcentric or male-centered world to have Mary be the protagonist. In the Gospel of Luke, who's the one who's standing up and talking to the angel and saying, be it done unto me according to your will, and then going off to her cousin and giving us a big poem, the song of Mary, the Magnificat. It was radical for Mary to be such a protagonist, be the hero in the story. So are you ready to see Joseph in history now? Because when we talk about Josephology, what happens is that the scriptures talk about Joseph. And so once the scriptures, written in the first and second centuries, once they talk about Joseph, we're going to have like all sorts of stories and paintings and everything about Joseph, right? No. Remember, when do we see the first paintings of Joseph? 1490s of the Holy Family. <coughs> so let's take a look at the history of Joseph, Joseph in history. Devotion to Joseph dates back to the 800s. So for roughly 800 years, we had no devotion to Joseph. We didn't pray to Joseph for 800 years. In the 800s, the first text that we find, the first prayer the, or litany that we have him, that we see him in, uses the Latin phrase nutritor domini, the guardian of the Lord. In the bridge martyrology, it was found in northern France. That's the first mention of him in a list of saints in the 800s. By the 12th century, the 1100s, the Benedictines had inserted him into their liturgical calendar, meaning now they now had a mass to St. Joseph. Because what they did in the 1100s, they're trying to formulate a liturgical calendar every day. If we say mass every day, who are we going to say mass to today? Follow me? So they had to think through all of the old saints of the church. Okay, today, what's the date today? August the 20... Fourth. Okay. August the 24th. What saint do we want to pray to and honor the Mass for today? Follow me? August the 25th. Okay, tomorrow. So which saint are we going to do? So as they're filling the calendar with saints in the 1100s, that's when, for the first time, we see them including Joseph into the church's calendar. Thomas Aquinas, who lived in the 13th century, he died in 1274, noted that Joseph was necessary in the plan of salvation, since Mary would have been stoned had it not been for her, and since Jesus, Joseph provided Jesus a human father. That was the 13th century that we're beginning to think about Joseph. 15th century, Jean Garçon of the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris wrote a 120 verse French poem in Latin to Joseph, which was sort of a radical thing. This is in the 1400s. He also preached sermons on Joseph at the 1417 Council of Constance. For the first time, we're beginning to look at Joseph and figure out, oh, this guy is actually kind of important. What can we as Christians learn from this guy? Can I preach a sermon or a homily on this guy? If so, what can I say about him? We're thinking about this for the first time in the 15th century. 1540, the first church dedicated to St. Joseph was built. Boy, we take this for granted because we hear of all these <coughs> churches dedicated to Joseph, right? San Jose, Catholic Church. Who's that named after? St. Joseph. Oh, there have always been St. Joseph churches, right? No, the first one was in 1540. Less than 500 years we've been naming churches for St. Joseph. The first church that was built to Joseph that we've discovered is San Giuseppe de Falignami, St. Joseph of the Carpenters in Rome. 1597, we have the first litany of St. Joseph published in Rome. So we're beginning to, to, call, to cultivate devotion now. We all know a litany. A litany is a prayer to so St. Joseph. It would be a prayer to St. Joseph. 
with an increase in art to the Holy Family in the 16th century, so now that we're starting to paint the Holy Family, Joseph becomes a sort of comic figure whose age was emphasized. Uh, D.S. Lieber, Jordan, could one of you run over to the chapel and grab the image of the sleeping Jesus off the, the altar in the front, see if you can find it, the sleeping? So now that Joseph becomes this comic, now that we're painting these three together, we have to figure out how we're going to paint them. And some of those paintings are going to start showing Joseph in, a, in very <coughs> human ways. This is a more comical figure. In fact, Pope Francis is fond of an image that's popular in Latin America of a sleeping Joseph. So we'll see if Deacon Stephen can find the image of the sleeping Jesus. Did you ever notice that over on the, the altar that we have in the chapel? We have, we have a saint, a picture, it's an image of a saint that's sleeping. You're thinking, who's that? What a goofy thing. We're <laughs> so used to seeing saints who are portrayed as holy and praying or standing in you know, very prayerful poses. And then with them, we have an image of a sleeping person. And that image that you know, this comes from our chapel, the main altar of our chapel. Who is this guy? What's he doing? That's relaxing. <laughs> I don't know that was St. Joseph. St. Joseph. And this image is popular in Mexico, but even more popular in South America, because Pope Francis is, is largely responsible for making this image famous now because of his devotion to the sleeping St. Joseph. <laughs> But it fits with this entire story. You know, here's an older guy. So now suddenly we have these popular images where Mary is with her child Jesus, and being younger, she's able to, you know, stick with him a little more, a little more energy, while Joseph is a little less peppy. <laughs> over, over getting his little siesta. The way those guys work. Typical in dad. A, in a hundred degree weather. And all that, man. I don't blame them. So part of the part of the, the ritual, if you want to know sleep. what they do in Latin America and why this has become so popular in places like Mexico, is if there's something that's causing you to lose sleep, <laughs> right? You find yourself up at night worrying about this or that. And what they do in Latin America is you write it down on a piece of paper and you stick it under Saint Joseph and you go back to sleep and let him mm. let him take care of it while you're sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> Give me one. <laughs> this is the first time I see something like this. I need pencil and paper. You need to be careful and courage. <laughs> Anthropologists refer to these sorts of things as shamanism, which simply means that if you believe something happens, but it can't be scientifically proven, if you believe that if you say certain things, that certain things will happen, or if you do certain things, and certain things will happen, but you can't scientifically prove it, they refer to that as shamanism. All, all cultures have shamanistic elements, including our Christian Catholic religion. If I were to believe, and there may be something, there may be something psychological to that, right, about me being able to just hand over my cares, find sign some ritual way for me to be able to say, okay, I'm worried about this, but I'm not going to worry about it now. So how would that be different from faith? Ooh. Faith is all about belief. Shamanism certainly has had more to do with the action. Anthropologists, they do study the, the beliefs of people, but even more so they study the actions of people. So that, uh, what would be a good example of that? Faith is, is a belief, right? I believe, uh, I can't sleep tonight, but I'm just gonna say a prayer to God, Lord, help me, help me with my kids, I don't know what to do with them, or my spouse, or whatever. Seems to me that's a response of faith. Shamanism, what action would I take as a result of that? Here, Father Jamie's encouraging people to write down to go out to Catholic art and gifts and buy a statue of the sleeping Jesus. <laughs> or to, to go out and buy a statue of Joseph. You've heard of this one, right? I'm trying to sell my house. Father, what can I do to sell my house? I heard I'm going to go to Catholic art. 
excuse me, Kathy, I guess I wonder how often they get that question. Where can I find a statue of St. Joseph that I can bury upside down in my yard? You've heard of this before. Yeah, I've heard that. Right? Yeah. They sell it Joseph. like that, too. St. Joseph. They, yeah. they, they make these images yeah. of St. Joseph for you to be able to stick in your yard upside down, thinking that St. Joseph's like, okay, I better help them find this house, because I, get, I don't want to be upside down forever. Oh Human beings do these sorts of things, which anthropologists would look at and label under the category of shamanism. But the question for an anthropologist would be, does putting an upside down statue of St. Joseph in your front lawn help you to sell your house more quickly? I'm not aware of any scientific studies that have proven that, but that would be an interesting thing. Oh. Certainly an interesting belief, faith, which manifests itself in this action of doing something. It's one thing between. It's one thing to pray to God and say, please, Lord, help me sell my home. It's another to, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, there's no judgment on anyone who does do what works, I say. I'm moving on. <laughs> Beginning in the 16th century, we started praying to St. Joseph for his help and protection. St. Teresa of Avila in the late 16th century, who died in 1582, credited her recovery of health to St. Joseph. So once you have a great saint like St. Teresa of Avila, Santa Teresa, who starts saying, I prayed to St. Joseph and I was healed, then suddenly what do people start doing? They start telling their, their comadre, hey, you're not, hey, I heard the saint Santa Teresa prayed to St. Joseph and got well. Maybe you should pray to St. Joseph. Protector of virgins. 1870, Pius IX proclaimed Joseph the patron saint of the Universal Church. 1870, that was the First Vatican Council. Time of the First Vatican Council. Saint Joseph is the patron saint, the protector of the church. 1889, Leo XIII encouraged Catholics to pray to Joseph as the patron of the church and prescribed that a prayer to Saint Joseph be added to the rosary every October. Ooh, think about that for a moment. Who are you praying the rosary to? Mary. And Joseph? Did you say any prayer to Joseph this evening? And so the other 13th suggested, well, Catholics, if you're praying to Mary all the time, maybe, how's this? In the month of October, add in a little prayer for Joseph. <laughs> and to incentivize you to do it, I'll give you an indulgence. Did I get that right? <laughs> yes. What's an indulgence? You get a few more points, a few more hours or days out of purgatory if you pray to Joseph and you pray your rosary. <laughs> One way to encourage people to pay In the 1950s, the first three centers on Joseph were founded for the study of Joseph in Valladolid, Spain, España, St. Joseph Oratory in Montreal, Canada, and in Viterbo, Italy. And finally, in 1989, John Paul II presented Joseph as the model for loving fathers as part of a series of apostolic exhortations that he published referring to Joseph as the guardian of the Redeemer. Questions, comments, opinions, insights into Joseph, this man who is part of the Holy Family after which our parish is named. We have two images of him over in the church, the main altar and the side altar. Right? That's that guy that we see. Why is Joseph a saint again? Why is, he... Why is Joseph a saint? Probably largely related to, to what he did here. I mean, when we think of him protecting Mary from being stoned, if it weren't for Joseph, Mary Mary would not have lived to bear a child. That would bear in the, that's the name of saint. Yeah. I mean, like the provider and protector of Jesus through his life. Protector, right? the guardian of Jesus, the stepdad of Jesus. What, what happens is we often think, when we think of saints, we're like, well, doesn't the church like require certain miracles yeah, for canonization? Right. Well, you've got to imagine that there are enough people in the history of the church, like St. Teresa, who said, I prayed to Joseph, and I was healed. But, so the angel, according to somebody, huh? um, appeared to Mary saying she was going to give birth to Jesus. That's right. So, was it 
like not common knowledge then that Jesus was to be birthed by Mary, therefore protecting her from being stoned to death. Uh, let's unpack that. So the two stories that we have, one is Matthew's story, the other is Luke's story. Remember, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Mark and John don't tell us anything about Jesus as a kid. Remember that? Mark was the first to be written, doesn't say anything about his childhood. So Matthew and Luke come along and they talk to us about Jesus' childhood. Luke is the one who's going to say that, that Gabriel appears to Mary. Matthew's going to say that the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph. What they were trying to explain is how it is that Mary could give birth to the Son of God without having sex with another guy. Follow me? What was their explanation? That Mary was found, that she conceived by the Holy Spirit. So I think what we see here is both of them both have a device of being able to explain how it was that Mary, that, that Mary conceived of Jesus not through another guy, but instead, in one story, the angel comes to Mary and says, Mary, God is for you, you're pregnant. In Matthew, which I think is probably a more human story, I mean, in this story, Joseph's probably at breakfast the next day saying, yeah, an angel, let me just understand this story now. Don't want to accuse you of lying, but you're telling me that an angel came to you last night and said that you're pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Imagine yourself as a parent or as a spouse. If, you're, if, you're, if your spouse or your child came to you one day and said, oh, by the way, I'm pregnant, and by the way, I didn't have sex, I promise. <laughs> what? This was their way of explaining how Jesus came through Mary, but not through sexual intercourse as everyone else on the earth did. Right? Would, would Elizabeth and Zechariah be saints also? Would Elizabeth and Zechariah be saints also? They are. They are saints. Yeah. There were more than one... Like during this time, more than one person was claiming to be the Messiah, right? More than one person claimed. Lots, right? lots of people claimed to be the Messiah. So that could be a reason why they wouldn't necessarily want to protect Mary, correct? Because they didn't know for sure. Even if she is saying, we don't know, there, more than one person has already said this. You're not the first. <coughs> I don't think she told anybody because I think that she knew that it would put her put them at risk, right? Like they didn't go around telling people that Jesus was the Messiah when he was a kid, right? Part of the challenge of these stories, too, is we have to recognize these, these are not written as, as their things are taking place, right? Matthew's written maybe around 70 to 80 AD. Luke is written maybe 75 to 85 AD. So we're talking about stories that are you know, 70 years after the fact, which would be like us. Help me out with the math. 70 years ago would be 1952. 52. I mean, that's writing about something that happened in the 40s or 50s. But isn't there a story about um, one of the holies not dying before he was able to see Jesus? There Simeon? Was the story of Simeon at the presentation? Yes. Yeah. In the Gospel of Luke, we have. So the then they already the, knew. I mean, he knew that according Jesus to the story, was. Yes. According to the story, he knew that the Messiah had already come. He was just waiting to see him. talks to Mary, and Matthew the angel talks to Joseph. Their way of explaining how it was that Mary, this is no ordinary birth, Mary did not have sex, I promise you. She conceived by the Holy Spirit. So it says here that, that he resolved to divorce her quietly. Do they eventually end up divorcing? or Almost. Joseph was going to divorce her quietly when the angel of the Lord came. So that then is, Luke's story makes sense. That, they're, both, they're both ways of being able to explain. But they communicate. Joseph I mean, imagine, imagine for, for a moment being Joseph and hearing that your fiancé or your wife is pregnant and you know it wasn't you. What do you do with that? Hence, this story of the angel bringing Joseph and Mary. Mario? Of course, Joseph and Mary had to talk to each other, to And she convinced him that... Well, she convinced him. 
and it could have been respected her. her. Or in this story, it wasn't Mary Hemingway. I said, just the angel came to Joseph and said, "Yeah, she's." But she said, "Mm-hmm." How <laughs> Mary? He's fixing to play. throw the first stone. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh. What do you do with that? But which is why I think part of it is well, you know why, why would we honor Joseph as a saint? Probably for that reason. Talk about a person of faith. Mm. Talk about a leap of faith. You know, I'm not sure that I believe my wife. She's never lied to me, but this is pretty serious. She's but, pregnant. The kid is not mine. But I'm just gonna, I'm going to believe. But I have faith. Audio. But in real life, sometimes. Some men will marry somebody that already had a baby. I mean, yeah. of, some, sort of, of some other guy, you know. There are all sorts of tremendous men yeah. in this world and women in this world. That's just how much he loves her. There you go. It is a sign of love. Enough on Joseph and Josephology for one night. Is there enough to think about for an evening? We conclude the prayer, glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, a world without end. Amen. Thank you for joining us for this study in Josephology.